All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Sea Mask podcast, the Christian Masculinity Podcast. I'm your host, even though I'm the new guy, Mike Pantile. I'm joined by my League of Extraordinary Gentlemen co-hosts, the Culture War Crusaders themselves. We've got Timothy J. Gordon, Will Noland, and Nick Stumphauser. Guys, how you doing? Pretty well, Mike. How are you? Extremely well. You know, it's funny, um, for those of you that don't know, I'm obviously the new guy. And so a week after I was uh, invited to come on as a permanent fixture, I was not here. So as like Nick said and joked that I, I asked for paid time off after getting the job. So appreciate you guys holding it down last Friday, but I will be on here, whether you like it or not, my Guido face as part of this handsome panel. Timothy, Nick, how you guys doing? Good. So good. good. Excited to uh, see what you see what we're talking about today. Yeah. So I'm an off the cuff kind of guy. I do have some notes here, but I, you know, since this red pill, red pill topic is a little bit tiresome for me, but it's still a bit hot. And I do think we need more voices, at least, you know, Christian masculine voices speaking out against it. And I kind of wanted to tie it, tie it into uh, King Solomon. So for those of you that don't know, you should know King Solomon was the wisest, wealthiest man that's ever lived. He's uh, uh, a fixture in the Old Testament, Old Testament king, wrote the book of the Ecclesiastes at the end of his life after a lifetime of pimping and simping and worshiping idols and concubines and acquiring wealth, and essentially concluded that a man's duty an obligation is to fear God, keep his commandments, and that he should rejoice in the lab his labor, the fruit of his labor, and the wife of his youth, which is the complete antithesis <laughs> to the red pill, what do these weirdos call it, a praxeology, ideology, whatever. And so, obviously, Solomon has warned us that the, the folly and the downfall of this type of lifestyle, and I know these guys aren't religious by any means, some of them are, which is kind of weird, but do these men really think they know better than Solomon. Is this a case of like intel or sin darkening the intellect and deadening the the the, the conscience? Um, why is it fallen out to this degree? And why do they think they know better? And I got some other points too that I think are very important. But let's just let's just start there. What do you guys think about that? It's it's definitely a case of laugh while you can. I saw mm -hmm. Rolla Tomasi responding to some Christian inquiry on Twitter yesterday by saying, um, I can't, I can't wait. Um, someone said, Oh, well, you'll, you'll meet Jesus soon enough. And he was like, well, great. Cause I have lots of questions for him. He's trying to talk like he's in a Western film. You know, he's <laughs> trying to have the, the Clint Eastwood one liner, uh, that, that Clint wrote into every single film was a, a famous new one liner. Rollo is the ultimate LARP and LARPy guys, whose heyday was the nineties, you know, my, you know, maybe early nineties, maybe late eighties. I'm not sure exactly how old Rolo is, but um, original Miami vice, not the reboot is his jam. And you say stuff like that, you know, in like an eighties cop buddy film, you're like, aren't you, aren't you worried you're living too fast for, for Jesus, man, we all have to meet him. We all have to pay one death. And he's like, can't wait to get there. Like he's, <laughs> I got a ton of questions for him. Like that's literally how this goofball tweets. And then, and, and then Chase is just trying to find out, are you old Testament or new Testament, you know, uh, <laughs> on, online. And it's impossible to tell. Cause he's too much of a like doofus to even know what he would have considered himself raised with religion natively. So he's like, above the categories just by wanting to be Don Johnson so much. So is this what happens with guys that LARP as if they're never going to die? We all are. That's well said. It, it won't be as cool as he imagines when he hasn't got his beanie on. <laughs> You're going to get judged with no yeah. beanie. <laughs> did you see that uh, the, uh, the cover photo for their live that they just did? And it was all like the AI cartoon. He looked like a lesbian. <laughs> it's like how do you I don't know why this guy's such a such a fixture and yeah there's so many of us that are like dude just say Christ is Lord say Christ is Lord and it's like well I'm yeah I think he's I think he's Old Testament Nick and Will any any other thoughts on on this these men thinking they know better than our boy Solomon well it was Pascal who said uh, men hate religion and fear it might be true and I think there's a deep fear in the red pill ranks that maybe Christ really is Lord and you can't just run around 
doing whatever you like and things do matter. There is good, there is evil. It's not just a amoral praxeology as they describe it. What more terrifying thought could there be to them than to have to face the fact that the way they've lived their lives will land them in hell unless they repent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to further support the, the likelihood of an Old Testament uh, foundation, it's quite interesting how rapidly it turns into blasphemy and mm -hmm. and bashing Christ. It's it was fast with with Rolo and company, and I I didn't even really have words when Tim you texted me that picture that Rolo had, had generated or edited. I think it was a painting, and he like edited it to be more red pill adjacent, and you just recoil. And <clears throat> I try not to. Uh, you know, get all LARPy, like, if I saw him in person, I'd defend my <laughs> Lord, you know, like, because I spent seven years, like, grievously blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ. So, like, I know you, you have to meet that with the same type of temperament that Christ would, which is they know not what they do. Uh, but it's a, it's a bold way to live. It's a very bold way to live. And I think it probably the the glibness with which they live this way um i is in part due to the lack of uh good like religious education you know the bible is just this old book that you don't have to care about you know and, and i think i'm very excited to see where you go with this mike because i've never considered solomon in the way that you are right now which is like the the epitome of the red pill in the old world. He's he is what Andrew Tate pretends to be. He had six or seven hundred wives, more more wealth than any billionaire alive today. And then you read Ecclesiastes, and like I, I made the mistake once of listening to Ecclesiastes on a drive, and I've like never induced depression faster. Yep. <laughs> I actually tell all my you know fellow entrepreneurs to read Ecclesiastes often. Yeah. It's yeah. a reminder that we all need. And so, yeah, I look at Solomon very much like the, well, Tate as like the modern day Solomon, even though Solomon is like a million times the man that Tate ever could possibly be. Right. And I actually did the math on what just one person was paying Solomon per year for his consulting quote unquote services. And it was to the tune of like 270 million US dollars in modern day <laughs> currency. So like this guy had more money, more hosts, more of all this stuff. And yeah, it, 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 is, it's, it is quite depressing to see somebody like Tate is just it's just so funny and i don't know if there is enough of this dialogue around you know pulling out these i mean i know will you we were talking about uh the next segment of this podcast talking about masculine figures in the bible it's super important we don't have enough of that so where i'm kind of going and it's actually quite interesting to see the more that you rattle the cage of these demons the angrier they get and the more bait they throw out at us like for example rollo going full on into blaspheming and i find like the more you engage with pearl the dumber she sounds too. Like the the engagement farming and the the that dopamine, you know, loop. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just becomes it's so that that's their life. I mean, if you guys especially notice the same thing. Especially when articles religious. Like yeah. Yeah. When, when I when me and Nick first started chatting with Pearl, it was like, oh, okay. She said she was raised Catholic, like nine or 10 brothers and sisters. And she's nice when you talk to her off, off the scene. And especially what she was saying in early to mid 2023 was baby, basically just pulling women off their high horse, which I love, you know, I'm like, Hey, this is cool. We still, we started out as fellow travelers. And then I, I went on her show twice and she was favoring the most non-Christian guests, which is always one of those things you don't need a barometer for human minds. Mm -hmm. Human heart is very sensitive barometer measuring equipment for whose side are you on? Like it, you don't even have to be sharp. Everyone knows when you're in a room and someone's favoring like this guy and trying to prop him up and make him the uh, Lamar Jackson, you know, new NFL MVP, even though he's like the 20th best player in the league and they're trying to prop him up. Uh, you're everyone's everyone senses that. And I sense that both times I went on Pearl show and the second time I got annoyed, I was like, Hey, can you, you're being a girl. And you, you're not supposed to do that, Pearl. You're interrupting me nonstop because you're trying to prop up the arguments of this Paul Elam guy, even though I'm destroying them. And then I, I was peppering in my answers some 
I don't like the the Christ pill term because it's tacky, but some 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 Christ answers. And she wasn't going for them, even like a normie Catholic that's never been to the Latin mass, you know, like they'll usually go for them. They're like, oh, wow, that that's a that's a more based way of saying it than my early 2000s Catholic school. Uh, she had no interest. And so th there there seems to be something deeply endemic to that side and having aversion to final non-relative religious truth. And there is no such thing as final non-relative religious truth outside of Christianity. It's, it's also the acceptance of the whole framework that the sexual revolution provides because they genuinely do seem to think of male-female interactions in this battle of the sexes terms where it's about what men can get in terms of pleasure, what women can extract in terms of resources, and it's all transactional rather than being fundamentally ordered towards children and family life. So I wonder whether they are so far gone in some ways that it's difficult to reach them. And you just can't reason with unreasonable people. I have a, qu I have a question. Could I just say that real? Could I add to that real fast? It's you can't reason with someone that's like you present a great argument and they call it a lie. Like I remember we were I was telling Pearl about uh, the return matchmaking. And um, I was like, well, look, we got well, I've, I've talked to like 200 women and they all want like virgin men are close to it. And most of them are virgins or, you know, under three body count. Impossible. Like, well, they're all just lying. Impossible. And I was like, oh, okay, she's gone. She's gone. Like, right. I like her personally. She's nice, but she's gone. Anyway, Nick, sorry. Go ahead. No, you're, you're good. I just, the, Will, what you said uh, sparked a question in me. So all three of you have kids. You're all fathers and you're all husbands of more than a few years. Um, neither of those things apply to me. And so I think I can relate a little bit more to the disposition of the red pill, pearl, Rolo, in that um, I'm in full contact with what it's like to only care about myself. Not to say I'm a, 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 a selfish person, but like when I'm hungry, I eat and I'm not thinking like, it has my family eaten yet? You know, what am I doing today is completely determined by me. Will, when you say that the purpose of marriage and male-female relations like that is for children and like family it's kind of got like a weird tinge to it to me because i'm like well what about the romance what about the like the love between the two people and i'm wondering if when the opposition i'll just say doesn't have kids isn't in like these committed christian relationships they don't actually see that like it's all coherent it's all part of the same thing and so they think that they're mutually exclusive things that like you have to get rid of romance and love and excitement in order to have like a virtuous family life. Yeah, they, they want the pleasure without the responsibility. And then they imagine that after you're married, the responsibility kills the pleasure. That's the way that they look at the whole thing. But obviously the point of the pleasure, just like with food tasting great, is to get you to eat, to nourish your body. It's an inducement to do the action that's good for us according to natural law. And it's the same thing with feelings of romance and attraction and chemistry. That's binding man and wife together. And it persists in a healthy, well-ordered marriage for life because it's like superglue that is there for the sake of the stability of the marriage, for the benefit of the children. So that's why when I'm helping out guys with marriages that have gone astray, we talk about you should be flirting every day. You should be making her laugh and you should be more like the guy you were when you first wooed her and she was impressed by you. It's your fault that you've let all that go and it's going to suffer as a result. So, so yeah, they go together, Nick. Pleasure and responsibility, they're hand in hand. I, I think one of the most, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to steal the thunder, uh, Mike, at all. Um, the I think one of the most radical ideas that, Tim puts forward in the case for patriarchy is the idea of weaponized chastity and making marriage sexy. And, and that I think might be like part of the silver bullet to the red pill stuff is 
like if you if if we go with the food analogy, like they're just kind of gluttons. They're saying like you should go eat as at as many restaurants as possible and like take pictures of your food and post it on Instagram and just keep eating. And that's like disgusting. <laughs> that's really, really gross behavior. Like, why yeah. are you eating so much? Yeah. And that actually leads perfectly into the next the next point I wanted to talk about was that this whole idea that you got to get X amount of uh, partners under your belt in order to, you know, understand female nature and in order for you to, you know, know that you're sexually compatible, which is so dumb. That's the dumbest thing ever. Because this is this is the thing. And I don't think there's enough conversation around this specific topic is that I can do I do agree from their perspective that a lot of Christian men get into relationships and they pedestalize the woman and they don't understand female nature, sin nature, right? But coming from a guy like me, I'm trying to tell you, kind of like Saul before he became Paul, like, hey, bro, crucifying these Christians over here, like, let, take it from me, not a good idea. Because I can tell you, as a guy that came from a degenerate background that had all this experience, that lived that way, um, that the, the sex and the intim intimacy that I experienced now with my wife is head and shoulders above what I've ever experienced before as a casual fornicator, head and shoulders, like even from a physical pleasure standpoint, there's something about it. It's like almost like God reserved that <laughs> for marital union. And so I think there's got to be a lot more co uh, conversation around, hey, listen, men, like you listen to any of these dudes, there's nothing to be had over here, but let's talk about female nature so you're aware without having to go over there because there was this guy um who was talking about how oh you know 50 women that's not that even even that much and like how do you know how shady women can be if you haven't slept with them i'm like that's the dumbest reasoning ever but again there's not a lot of conversation from our side saying okay let's talk about female sin nature so you know what you're getting into you don't yeah. have to be a degenerate i've never understood the claim and i think i'm trying to assess it more deeply than it's being leveled when they say to understand female sin nature, go have one night stands, that that's more conducive to bringing out male male sinful nature, right? right. You, you bed a girl using their like cheat math for, I'll, I'll just be honest, like for usually foreign brown guys who are like Muslims or Jews that 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 went to AP class in high school and were horny for white chicks. That's that's what the red pill is. It's basically foreign guy. Foreign smart guy, AP math. I was really sexually frustrated and I wanted to sleep with white chicks. And I was this kind of foreign guy or, or, you know, first generation born here. And I use all these tricks, which is dishonest. And I bedded this chick and then I sent her packing in the morning. Yeah, I, I got her an Uber and I got her out of my, my place. You're not going to learn anything about the lady. You're not going to learn. And she's probably not a lady, by the way, but you're not going to learn anything about her tricks. That's more like she's learning the ugly ways of the world from the man. He's bespoiling her. And so you don't, if, for a couple things, you don't learn about the tricks that, that females do tend toward using, you know, the way men, men fall into certain sinful traps and B, you're not going to learn how to like, <laughs> to use a boomer term, become a more skillful lover to not be gross. Like you only learn that, by having experience after sexual experience with one person and they tell you oh adjust this they're the first people to say this is very very preferential preferentially motivated uh sexual relations therefore they should follow they, they should be quick to take the the point that really monogamy is the way you get good at pleasing one person and they they just will never touch that point and no one ever challenges them on it yeah, why do you think figure skaters stay with their skating partner for a long time? It's because you yeah. can finesse the thing and you learn what that person does. And it's yeah. the same with sex, which is a bit like that in exactly that sense. Do you know what as well? The other big falsehood here is that you can take one of these guys who has to learn all these devious tricks to try to manipulate women because he hasn't got them naturally. And you can get him loads of experience. And the science shows that he still can't bring a woman to orgasm as well as a virgin that she is just genuinely attracted to. I can pop the reference for that in the chat later if you guys want it, but it's just some secular scientific studies. And 
the virgin Chad brought the woman to orgasm better than the very sexually experienced but unattractive guy. Yeah, that's just the again. It's everything's turning. Do you guys know what like a mukbang is? Oh, Have you yeah. ever seen that? I need. Mean, it's just like people who just eat a bunch of food on camera on YouTube for some reason. Um, it, yeah, everything's turned into pure gluttony, and then I'm sure pornography has not helped in that. They think that they're that experience is like mechanical. Or that like improving like athletic performance sexually is improving intimacy. And it's like I was a dancer for many, many years since I was 14. And I had the same dance partner for like six years. And was he good? <laughs> I set myself up for that one. Yeah, he yeah, was the did. best. He was the best. <laughs> <laughs> no, she uh was she was very good and that will, will what you described with like the figure skating is spot on. But when I, when I would go to dances there at Monday Monday nights in uh in downtown Michigan. Um and there would be, you know, 300 kids there on a summer night. And we'd all be, this is swing dancing. There's nothing, nothing incredible like ballroom or dancing or whatever, just very standard Midwestern kid swing dancing stuff. But when you got into like the aerials and whatnot, and you would, a, a new girl would want to try a particular aerial, you were relearning the physics of like her body every single time. Whereas the girl that I danced with for six years, like I could do it blindfolded and Somebody told me this recently that the, and not to keep cutting my own self off, but like when it says Adam knew his wife, that's what intimacy is. It's like knowledge of the other person. It's not athletic performance. Like it's a sport. That's insanity. It's, <laughs> you know, or um, if you've ever seen the the movie, The Menu, to keep with the food analogy, um, Rafe finds plays this psychotic chef and, uh, it's, it's somewhat of a horror film and he traps everybody in this elegant restaurant and makes them the, these incredible dishes. And at the end, the, the protagonist just asks him to make a cheeseburger, just one cheeseburger. And it's a cheeseburger that he's made for like 40 years. And it was like the best meal out of anything. It's like, cause he just, that's what he knows. It's the best thing. It's not all about all these experiences the best experience was from the intimacy and that can't happen when it's n equals one n equals one n equals one yeah no you nailed it and so to tim's point too um yes you are experiencing more of like the the dark the dark side of of uh, male sexual nature but as a guy that's been there you are also exposing yourself to the worst acts aspects of women's sexual sin nature you see the men that they're humiliating behind their backs or men that they're cheating on with you and you become that guy on the other side and you see some of the real like i can understand their point from this aspect of you could really see how uh underhanded and deceptive women can be for sure but you also experience at the same time how much more jaded and pessimistic you become the more experience you get so it kind of goes back to that point where it's sexual experience is not something that you get out of your system you get it into your system because this is what part of what almost completely ruined it for me and my wife at the beginning was i almost cheated on her several times not as married couple when we were dating beforehand and so i had to break it off with her and because i it was something i got so far into my system i didn't know now know how to exist with a good woman and i not only that but you also felt less worthy of a good woman because i treated myself i think jordan peterson as meandering as I think he is sometimes, there's sometimes he gets things right. He goes, you cheap, you treat others like a cheap sexual object. You're treating yourself like that as well. But I, I just don't think there's enough conversation in the Christian manosphere, whatever you want to call it, about female sin nature. So these Christian men feel like they have to go out and experience it for themselves. So there's think, not enough conversation about sin or hell generally, Mike. Sorry right. to interrupt, but that's no. it. That's, it it's, it's part of that whole problem. Guys yeah. need to know more about hell and what they are risking with this kind of behavior. I don't. I wonder whether the whole red pill naming is like so many other of these slogans, like free love. The people behind it know what they're doing. This is red with the heat of hellfire, and you yeah. can read it in the saints too. Saint Bernard said that 
the human race is brought more under the power of the devil by lust than by any other sin. Mm. If you're going to cast the widest, most difficult net for people to get out of, this is it. You yeah, absolutely, this, absolutely nailed this it. Is the Go message ahead, of Fatima too is that, I was about to say that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, more souls fall into the pit because of sexual sin and anything else. I mean, people aren't going around becoming dictators you know there's just not that many other sins that that people are willing to trade in their salvation for besides sins of the flesh Wait, oh, is tim i thought you were going to reference the um uh the last battle is over marriage in the family the last oh, battle yeah. between satan and the church is over marriage in the family mm. yep the, the, well, same the, same thing right is sex for marriage or not right yep right yeah, yeah, no, abs ab absolutely bang on point, guys. And so, and I know I've I've referenced this passage in Romans from St. Paul all the time, but I do, do see you think, I, I see, I think we're seeing, I should say, the product of this like debased mind where they think what they're doing, like proclaiming to be wise, they become fools, right? They think that they've gained all of this worldly wisdom when really like we've been warned, this is why coming back to Solomon's point is that um, you don't know your asshole from a hole in the ground. Really, you're so entrenched in your sin, and I'm sure the church fathers talked about this as well. I can't remember if it was if it was Paul, or I can't remember who it is. But sin darkens the intellect, and when God has given you over to your unnatural desire and you've rejected Him so blatantly, obviously, what's the le next logical step for the red pill? We've talked about it before. It's homosexuality. Why wouldn't it be? Well, it's funny because that's also what happens with the atheists, and then you get um, Matt Delahunty. <clears throat> uh, dating a tranny, right? Because it's the same thing, you know. Well, did you see that video of Tate uh, talking about how he'd much rather have a Megan Fox that has a penis than a, an old lady or Hulk Hogan looking woman? Yeah, I can't tell um, if he's in jest or not. I don't know because sometimes he does that sort of stuff, but in jest or not, there's truth in jest. And that is the terminus of the red pill ideology because they, they do not, they do not have the rights to the words ought and should. You guys know Jack Donovan's book, the way of men. Yeah. I did a, a video on that a while ago called the way is gay because so he's a, he a literal homosexual <laughs> and you can see the, the reductio ad absurdum of all this thinking because it's like, well, how can I be the most masculine guy I can possibly be within this framework? Mm, I only get turned on by men. I only touch men. No women for me. That's where it ends up because female nature is just not worth it. So they just despair and then have a big bro hug circle jerk. <laughs> can I make a fast point, Mike, about your surprise at the fact that after developing a lifetime of bad habits, an adult lifetime of bad habits with regard to intersexuality, um, it was difficult for you to practice monogamy. This shouldn't have surprised you at all. No. Like Aristotle says, virtues, not an act, but a habit. Vice is not an act, but a habit. And th this is why it never works for guys to get it out of their system and then go try to be monogamous for the next 50 to 60 years. Same thing, pace bachelor parties. It does no good to be like, okay, one last hurrah where you have a stripper rub up against you. This is a hor horrible practice. Obviously, people in the audience already know that. But it's like getting ready for a big marathon and eating the heaviest uh, food that's going to give you diarrhea while you run. Or it's like... <laughs> The night before the Super Bowl, getting really trashed, you know, drinking 12 beers. And so you're you're you have, you know, beer bloats in the morning. This is the equivalent of the habits that are being admonished by boomers. Take a gap year after college, you know, go find yourself in hostels in Europe and then you can get you can settle down after that. It, it makes zero sense because people evidently don't care enough to learn Aristotle or basic natural law that, that you, you, you know, you practice the way you play. In, um, in Dante's Inferno, um, no Purgatorio, sorry. The lust is the sin that has got the uh, most like trenchant hold on man. It's the one that takes the longest to purge. And Mike, you were talking about 
betting that the church fathers and saints had said something about that stubbornness. I was looking for some stuff before the show. Um, St. Thomas of Villanova, no one is so obstinate in sin as the impure. And what you're dealing with on X, mm. on YouTube, whatever it is, when you talk to these guys, it's that obstinacy. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And there is... <laughs> I was reading uh, Ecclesiasticus this morning and I took a picture. And so to a man that is a fornicator, all bread is sweet. He will not be weary of sinning unto the end. And that kind of kind of speaks to this point, right? Like this lust having such a stronghold. I just, I think, and you're absolutely right, Will, to kind of cap off this point. I think there's got to just be more discussion around hellfire and the punishment and the separation from God versus this like woo woo bullshit you get this in in protestant and even catholic churches where it's like yeah god is all loving and all gracious and all this all this stuff but remember to read the whole bible and not just the ones that you know cherry pick you're cherry picking that make you feel all giddy inside and so that kind of leads to the next point too is that and i know tim we were talking about this in the group with uh foster and chase was that some of my qualms around this debate between the patriarchs and the manosphere is that is this message casting pearls before swine because they don't have ears to hear or eyes to see? So I'd be curious. I kind of know where your, your head is at with this stuff, Tim, but I know there are people out there that are probably curious. What do you think about that? Because I'm kind of torn of what well, this conversation is even worth having with them, you know? You bring the gospel to the town, the next town that's on the map, and if they don't hear you, you kick the dust from your sandals, same as our Lord taught directly. And except... There's one um, non-likeness, uh, one distinction. When we do this on the internet in front of several million people, we're mainly addressing the unknown guy out there in front of his computer screen, not the uh, four LARPy douchebags in front of us. So it, <laughs> we hope that they're we hope that they get converted as well. But I'm I'm kicking the dust from my sandals uh, hard on them and expecting to. The God's grace works mysteriously. If they convert, great. If not, we're doing it for the big audience out there. Mm -hmm. Yep. People sometimes ask me, why do you spend time replying to Instagram DMs or why do you engage with tiny accounts on Twitter? And there's a small chance you might read the direct person you're talking to, but it's the people watching that you're really after. That's what makes mm -hmm. it worthwhile. I don't think we can do much ourselves to reach people who are deep, deep into mortal sin. Uh, God's grace can call them back. Not that they deserve it, but he can, and hopefully he does. And the first response has got to be uh, mourning, isn't it? Blessed are they who mourn, because it's the spiritual tragedy what's happening to the red pill guys. We don't want them ending up in hell. So you've got to be sad for them. I know we mock them sometimes, but that's because shame is a good thing. And it's good to make people feel that sting. But you've got to be sad for them primarily and pray for them. I think why I have any stamina for this conversation, because it can get exhausting, especially the Twitter dialogue can get quite exhausting. Oh yeah. Is because the I think despair is what permits sin as much as pride can as well. Um and I think a lot of these guys, and including Pearl, if you look at the her temperament in the tweets, it's despair. It's there's no point, there's no hope, it's too far gone. Women are broken. The world is broken. So you might as well take what you can and give nothing back to quote Pirates of the Caribbean. And I think what, what gives me fervor in this is like the case for patriarchy and anything that might transpire as a result of that in the future uh, gave me hope that there was something more beautiful, more exciting, uh, more Disney, and that's not a pejorative. I, I mean that more like in the childlike sense, more Disney than what the red pill story was, which is to say that Christianity is the best story. It's the one that's going to make you, give you the most warm fuzzies, the most pleasure, the most happiness, and maybe not in this life, but definitely in the next, and it's the holistic view of it. And like that's lost in the in the dialogue. And so I think if if I do my job right, and if we do our job right, it's not telling the listener or the red pill guys, um, you have to hit your hands with a hammer every day and like it. It's that you're you're literally going to be happier. You're going to sleep better at night. 
And that should give people hope. It should like young guys should hear what we have to say and think like, oh, we shouldn't give up on love and women. You can have it. You can have your love story. It just requires some some humility and, and sanctification, period. But it'll happen. Yeah, I agree. And I think there's got to be a lot more dialogue, too, because this the whole thing that backs this thing is also um, divorce and family law. Like, yeah. yeah, you know, all men want to get married in the nuclear family. This is what Myron says. And this was on this stream recently. Nuclear family is great, but, you know, times have changed. You could get divorce graped in 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 whatever and you're gonna get all your stuff taken from you so it's like it, it's a losing deal for men and i think bringing the conversation back to okay listen like you're taking a risk either way this is why it's also incredibly important to teach christian and catholic men how to vet their future wives so like there's a risk in both places i think we can unanimously agree that the risk and the reward with co co that comes with getting married and having children is far greater in terms of satisfaction, fulfillment, legacy, than just opting out. Because again, much like there's not a lot of dialogue and conversation around hell, there's not a lot of a conversation around, okay, well, these are the benefits of marriage, and this is how you mitigate against that risk. But you're taking a risk either way, bro. Do you want to be the 65-year-old guy that's still going to Miami and partying, or a 65-year-old guy that's holding his grandchildren? Yeah, no, that's, that's an old joke from the... Adam Sandler film, The Wedding Singer. I don't, I've never seen a 65 year old guy out at the clubs aside from drunkards like that, that everyone's laughing at. And it's, it's one in a crowd of two or 300. I'm referring mainly to the old rock clubs I spent my youth in, but at any of the clubs, it's not going to be different at the discotheques. If there's, if there is a 65 year old guy or even a 55 year old guy there, He's the laughing stock and he's usually a drunkard. So it's not as if there's some minority exception to the rule whereby, you know, 55, 60, 65 year old guys can can keep the dream alive. It just never happens. They're at home probably drowning their sorrows. And it is yeah. like well said, it's genuinely sad. And yeah. it's too late. Time only, you know, Dr. Heidegger's experiment, right? <laughs> Nathaniel Hawthorne short story. You can't repeat the past. There is no 1985 DeLorean where you can get back and be like, I need to go get a wife when I'm I'm going to go back to the year 1955 and I'm going to make different decisions. The, you are being tricked and robbed of your one opportunity in your in your, you know, 20s, maybe maybe in your 30s to get a good wife. Yep. And and to have kids, even if you get a good wife when you're 40, and you're like, maybe, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna pair off in a way that's um that makes biological sense. We both made the same mistakes, but you're gonna pay for that temporally by your lack of children. But if you get to 50, you're probably not even gonna find the wife. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what what solace will there be for you then? It's the same thing we say to women that bought into feminist rhetoric. Yeah. You're going to learn the hard way because the behavior that lands you in hell if you don't repent also starts creating a foretaste of hell on earth for you. Sin is its own punishment in that sense. And again, maybe I'm being reading too much into it, but just like with the naming of the red pill, I think the clue was in the terminology for anyone with ears to actually hear it with Playboy. They told you what they were going to turn you into a playboy and that free love came at the cost of your masculinity and your legacy. And it's how they were going to undermine patriarchy. And marriage now is talked about as if it's some kind of lifestyle that you just pick out from a whole bunch. Whereas really it's a command from God. It's a calling for the majority of men. Some of them, it's going to be celibacy and a different kind of life entirely. But Marriage is a command, be fruitful and multiply. And for a man to say that, no, that looks too frightening for me, is too risky. I haven't got the balls to do that. In some cases, literally, they'll just castrate themselves with vasectomies. For a man to say, I can't do that, it's not for me, that's effeminacy because you're being presented with a path that's hard, it's true, it's righteous, and you're saying you're not up to it. So there's a deep-seated cowardice there 
And I think it's part of the whole crisis of masculinity that we see around us. The guys are cracking out calculators and deciding that the X percent risk is too much for them, even if this is the greatest thing that they deep down want to do in life. Extremely well said. I also think it's quite a sad potential to think about when these guys are in their 50s and 60s and they're getting close to becoming impotent and they've got all this money and women now really no longer look at them the same way. It's like, I, it's hard to imagine a positive outcome there. And I just don't think there's any foresight from these guys whatsoever. Right. And also too, and this is not Nick, you're 25, you're, you'll be married and have kids soon enough. These guys talk about, you know, masculinity and, you know, trying to become men. There is a perpetual adolescence that men that don't have children and have not got married, uh, have not gotten married yet, it, uh, that they, they, they embody. Would you guys agree? Uh, there is a different kind of energy and even sense of like spirituality, emotional sense. Even when I had kids and I got married, there was a sense of like, I came to, I became, I finally got my balls as a man, so to speak. I mean, that was kind of the the core of the question that I was asking you guys when Will says that the purpose of sex and intersexual dynamics is marriage and family. And I was trying to say, like, well, I think that's super off-putting to the Red Pill guys, probably for what you just said, Mike, is they never grew up. They never had <clears throat> they never had to grow up. Yeah. And and so I think too, um, Another gripe that I have with this whole thing too, and I made a I made a reel this morning about it, is that we need to really stop shaking hands with these guys about what we agree on. They've got these biological truths that are based off of some bullshit evo psych stuff, and we've got the truth. And right. there's no such thing as like a middle ground because the devil built that fence right in the middle. It's either you we're over here on the side of truth, and it's up to us as men that are like, you know, smart patriarchs and guys like you, Nick, you have a voice in the fight as well, of course super smart, super capable about talking about biblical masculinity in a way that makes sense, but not just makes sense that is appealing to young men too, to interest them. Right. Not that we need to make it all foofy and fairy, but like, I hate the term Christ pill, but I understand why we're using it it's because it appeals to the zoomer language. We need to bring them. We need to bring them over on this side because enough of this, like, Oh yeah. You know, the red pills get this, the red pill men get this right. It's like, dude, fuck that. I don't care about what they get. Right. Because what is the worldview based off of? What's the foundation? It's defeat. It's bending the knee. It's capitulation, right? Ours is from a position of victory because the ultimate victory was made on the cross. So why are we agreeing with anything? Yeah. Well, to, to counter that, I would just say that there's a sense in which um, because Christ is truth with a capital T, all truth belongs to him. And you can just say to the red pill followers, Whatever it is there that you think is true, that resonates with you, we've got it better in a fuller, richer way. And you don't need it from them. All the insights into man's fallen nature, Christianity deepens and perfects. So the red pill gets its hooks into people, as it were, by just offering them a taster of some of those insights. But it can't really satisfy them, but Christianity can. Let me read to you guys uh, from from J.D. Unwin, which, Will, I know you know this. Um, okay. This is from Chapter 5 of Don't Go to College by me and uh, Michael Robillard. This is called Adult Daycare, and it's about the arrested development we're talking about here. Um, J.D. Unwin's findings were echoed by Sir John Glubb in his essay, The Fate of Empires and the Search for Survival. Glubb noted that Nations generally rose and fell over the course of a 250-year arc, covering six ages, age of pioneers, age of conquests, age of commerce, age of affluence, age of intellect, and the age of decadence, which um, people wear, where's America in this cycle now? It's obvious to identify. Regarding the age of decadence, Glub writes of medieval Baghdad. This is remarkable and remarkably a positive with our own times. The contemporary historians of Baghdad in the early 10th century deplored the degeneracy of the times in which they lived, emphasizing particularly the indifference to religion, the increasing materialism and the laxity of sexual morals. The historians commented bitterly on the extraordinary influence acquired by popular singers over young people, which is hilarious in medieval Baghdad, resulting in a decline in sexual morality. 
The pop singers of Baghdad accompany their erotic songs on the lute, an instrument resembling the modern guitar. Several caliphs issued orders banning pop singers from the capital. Within bass. a few years, they always return. Yeah, bass. Many women practice law while others obtain posts as university professors. <laughs> There was an agitation for the appointment of female judges, which, however, does not appear to have succeeded. Soon after this period, government and public order collapsed and foreign invaders overran the country. So, you know, we're how so screwed. We're, so we're screwed. screwed. We're, dude, yeah. we're, it's so over, bro. We were just saying, <laughs> don't get black pilled. And then I read that. And everyone's like, <laughs> yeah. Never mind. Never yeah. mind. Never mind. <laughs> that's the yes. us. That's medieval Baghdad, but that's us. Sorry, Will. Yeah, well. Just, I was going to say, Tim, at the end of that, in the in original Glaube essay, he twists a knife a bit and talks about the irony of feminism in Baghdad ending with the streets of Baghdad being too dangerous for women to walk alone on. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least there's that. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's hard not to get black pilled listening to that. <laughs> but that just wow. means, hey, dude, we got it. We got a job to do, right? That's right. That's right. Hundred percent. Um, okay, so another point that really frustrates me with this whole conversation too with these red pill guys is uh this this dumb label, Tradcon. What is a mm. Tradcon? And why are we not that? Because I don't think that we're that. No, I we're think not. it's easy to lump us in with uh the Daily Wire peeps and some of those feminists, but what's the difference? Patriarchs versus Tradcons. I, I don't know Feminism. why. Feminism. Yeah, it should be called yeah. the Femcons. Thanks. You, you yeah. take it, Nick. I, I I don't know where they got the trad from because they're not talking about. They don't even know the Catholic Novus Ordo versus trad debate. It's it's it should be Femcons is is what they're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what it all reduces to. And Mike, you were kind of asking, uh, using somewhat vague language, um, some good content to consume on online in general. Mm -hmm. And the it always, always, always reduces to the question of feminism. Can you speak honestly about what a woman is and what her role in society and in the home is? Yes or no? And the trad cons can't, which is why there are going to be women on this debate. <laughs> it just... Which is why they wanted the women. I mean, you can't really blame the red pill guys for wanting trad con. Let's just start calling them fem cons. Because that's a great straw man. I mean, that's that's the way to win an argument is to to argue against a fool. That's a way to win a foot race is to argue, run against someone that's 100 pounds heavier than you. And the red pill has made great triumphs, historically speaking, by arguing against feminists. This is what this, they're in their lifeblood. They exist. Um, it got, caused a tra. Um, because they can argue against feminists who don't marshal the correct points against them. And it doesn't matter whether it's a left feminist or a right feminist. Right, they yeah. want to argue against Lila Rose and Dr. Sidney Watson and uh, Candace Owens and Steven Crowder's wife because those women make the red pill look very viable, make it look like a winning worldview, which it's yeah. not. And that's why, except, like except the, ironically, they are feminists. Sorry, Nick. No, you they keep are. going, they keep are. going. Yeah. Because when you listen to them try to have those battles with the femcons, once you listen to those framework assumptions that I spoke about earlier regarding Pearl, you see that one of the big things they have in common is contraception. And we talk about with the matchmaking, one of the best questions to ask a girl to root out feminism is, how many kids do you want? And if it's anything other than as many as possible, then you've detected some feminism there because she's saying, well, no, I'm not really open to life. I'm not really open to the essence of my womanhood, which is the potential for motherhood. So that's a big thing. And it means that I don't think the red pill can actually offer any kind of solution genuinely to the problems that, strictly speaking, they can't even identify anyway, given they have no ought in their worldview. They just point at stuff and say, it happens. But we can say, no, it's wrong. And here's what you actually need to reject to be able to give proper solutions. And this is why I'm going to come down on the Protestants here too, because once you allow contraception in, you have a difficulty in saying that there's anything wrong with unmarried sex. 
because the primary reason that fornication, so unmarried sex is sinful, is that children have a right to married parents. But with contraception, what you're doing is severing sex from its natural end. So at that point, it's kind of, well, who cares? Who cares about homosexuality either? To take it one step further, something beginning with P, which we probably can't talk about on YouTube, but which the, the MAPs are big fans of as well. Well, contraception would open the door to that too. And this is why the sexual revolution is based on that as the main pillar, contraception with the pill especially, and then fornication. You've got those two things. The red pill embrace both because they're scared of the responsibility that comes with the pleasure of sex. So what is it about the sexual revolution they are actually rejecting? I can't see it. Yeah, two, two competing teleological conceptions of sex. It's either teleologically for procreation or for recreation. And if it's recreation, then you can't introduce an ought to that. That kind of is. Luckily, it's not. We can we can throw around as Catholics, we have the u unique perspective vantage point to throw around oughts with the is of sex because the is always uh, um, circumlocutes the idea of teleological procreative sex. Anything that's recreative which contradicts the telos of procreation, is off limits. And that's what I, I said to Pearl the second time I was on her show, well, just like Will said. And then she just didn't want to go there. That's why she kept just talking around me. And I'm like, no, 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 that's how, that literally, because once, you know, the we de-theologize uh, procreation as the point of sex, then fornication's okay. And, and normie bros want that to be okay. You know, hetero fornication. Then you're like, well, how about, homofornication. They're like, no, that's gross, dude. And I'm like, yeah, but but what's what's the conceptual starch block? They don't know it. Once homofornication's okay, what about homo uh, adultery? What about things that begin with P? They all just, there's a, a smell test with a point of no return for a lot of these normie bros, but they can't identify what the conceptual starch block is. And if it's not procreation, then it's nothing because it's just recreation. And uh, like Benedict said about if you're a relativist, cannibalism is just a matter of taste. And and that's why feminism is is the great equalizer. Um, because to say tradcon, you're thinking traditional. Uh, well, we have we have found that uh, in doing our our matchmaking service. <clears throat> the vast majority of trad cats women are still deeply feminist in ways that 100%. they didn't even realize deeply deeply feminist okay so you're not traditional and you're not a conservative because as we've seen the political spectrum most of these people are on the right if you were to give any you know four quadrant political test to all the people that we're talking about they're probably going to be somewhere on like the bottom right in like the libertarian but right of center. So conservative doesn't mean anything either. So what does it actually come down to? Feminism, which is the antithesis of patriarchy, which is to say uh, Luciferianism as antithetical to Christianity. If patriarchy is synonymous with Christianity and feminism is Luciferianism, then that's what it comes down to. That's the binary. Well, that's the whole conversation, right? It's 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 patriarchy versus degeneracy. It's not trad cons versus red pill. That's just sounds like a viral clickbaity. Let's get some views and some revenue from from YouTube. And so, like all these women, I used to be, you know, Candace Owens and all the, whatever. They say some base stuff, okay, whatever. But then I was really thinking about it. I'm like, okay, unpopular opinion. Their husbands are just purse holders. How can you talk about any of this stuff? <laughs> like, yeah. what do you do? like? What do you actually do? Go serve your family. Why are you right. on the front lines of the culture war? But it's also very telling, like why guys at Fresh and Fit want to have this conversation with them. They don't want a real conversation, right? They want a spectacle, like in the Coliseum, women in blood sport. Like, let's just watch something exciting. It's not actually for uh, uh, the this, this, this substance. Now, how do we effectively... I don't know if it's keep them on their heels or evangelize people and, and kind of influence them in a positive way. Is it just what we're doing is more, is there, is there more boldness needed? Cause I see a lot of, there's a soft approach, right? Where it's like, you know, just meet them where they're at and just love them, bro. Like this really almost like gay version, lukewarm version of Christianity, Catholicism. How do you actually effectively fight against 
this 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 quote unquote culture war or even can you nomenclature matters a lot hmm. and i like the transition that we've made or not the transition the the purification that we've made to our stance over the last couple of months from um you know christ pill all the way down to like this is patriarchy and what i would love to see because and i don't think it would be hard to facilitate this given the blasphemy that i saw rollo posting mm -hmm. <clears throat> i would like to see an equivocation a public equivocation between what the red pill is doing and luciferianism because it's not satanism as in like the worship of Baal or Baphomet, but it's Luciferianism in that it's the worship of the self. And if we can get them to publicly admit that they are their own gods, I think that does so much. Also, I think part of the answer, Mike, to take this back to the point of origin, which was your question about to do or not to do this debate, is it casting pearls before swine? Well... <laughs> There's nothing short of saying it. We need to be the ones representing the family, like these guys here. Um, the voice needs to be patriarchal, and it needs to be, which which always means Christianity, and specifically, the main tincture needs to be Catholic. Now, there are manly Calvinist bros, like Doug Wilson, and there are manly ortho bros. So there are some good Protestants and Orthodox who are in the fight that are good, but the main voice needs to be Catholic primarily because of the teleology of sex, which is what governs mm -hmm. everything. That's what mm -hmm. I mean. Like, I re ideally, <clears throat> you'd always have Will Noland there. Like, I, 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 that's a must. It's a must. That's what I keep telling Chase. It's just like, look, I, you know, case for patriarchy is going to be there. Mike Pantile is going to be there. Man, man, I want Nolan knows there. Like, like I've. Like I've wanted, you know, uh, just the the ultimate teammate. But the voice has to be Catholic, and it has to be ours, and it has to be mainstreamed, because I I don't know. I know the value in writing a book, and my wife wrote the accompanying book for for women, and it's only for women. On here's how to get married and to stay married, and if you've been married, doing it the wrong way for ten or twenty years, how you here's how you reverse it. Because we get emailed all the time. I know Will knows this too because he did, and we also do some personal coaching, not as much as the Nolans. But there's um every marriage or life that you help to save is infinitely valuable. But imagine that times one million or ten million views. The views that I'm going to borrow Nick's language now, are allowed to be allocated to the two false poles in the Hegelian dialectic, red pill versus feminism. If for once we could just steal that limelight, yeah. embarrass both sides, show that both sides are, are two sides of the same pale coin, and say this is the one true opposite, patriarchy, and it destroys both red pill and feminism. That's all it would take. It's the exception to the rule that the truth is allowed to, to get the limelight, the 10 million views. But all it would take is one appearance by this crew, Mike. That's well said. That's, yeah, that's how it needs to be. I've got to go for a lesson in a minute, guys. But Nick, your, your comment about luciferianism and new age masculinity reminded me of something that i got into on twitter with uh you know that guy jer the wall speaks who talks about a few body language things on x some of it's useful but he wrote a summary of his concept of masculine frame and before i heard nick talking about that i responded calling it satanism and the new age masculinity and let me just recap some of his points here so my opening line was that the similarities to a uh, woolly feel good feminist psychology are actually really striking. So he says, first up, the secret to having ultimate frame is this. You were already dead. Your troubles and worries were the anxious breathing of a dying animal. Now, first up, that's a lot easier than Christianity because you've got no soul to worry about. You're just a dying animal. So you can frolic in the field like a bull. And that gives you a totally different outlook on life. You can be reborn. We are able to run and chase game for a short time. 
So this is seize the day. You do you. Don't judge me. Real men don't judge. Don't dick police me. Jesus, don't dick police me. That's how they talk. Now, chasing game or fornicating then becomes a really high priority. It's the only thing that they care about. That's it. It's the main goal in life. So it's in a way becoming a kind of simp. And then the incoherence really begins. We have a will for a short time. What is that will? The greatest thing I have ever told myself is, wait for it, death is only physical. Life is only physical. So we said there's no hell, nothing to be afraid of. There it is. Death is just the end and that's it. Nothing to worry about. So if life is only physical, only matter exists. And since matter obeys the laws of physics and they're either deterministic or random, then there's no place for free will. So why are you complaining about girls with high body counts? They're just matter behaving according to the laws of physics. And sophisticated materialists at this point say that, okay, then free will isn't real, but the red pill aren't sophisticated enough to actually understand that. So then here's what they say. You were gifted a memory of the past that separates you from the screaming locusts. There is only the present moment. Past and future do not exist. This is really dumb if you think about it, because the idea that memory could somehow matter and make you different from locusts if the past never existed <laughs> makes zero sense. <laughs> so it's all just a rehashing of Nietzsche. That's all these guys have got. And some of the scholastic philosophers will also say, look, every man has ultimately got to choose between Aristotle's vision and Nietzsche's vision. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's all it boils down to. Either virtue is a real thing or it's just about um, power. Mm -hmm competing power narratives. Mm. So here's his advice. You must destroy not just the painful fruit of memory, but shape a new memory in its place. This is what it means to be born again. So that's Nietzsche's idea of the Superman and how you can remake yourself, which is what Nick was talking about with becoming your own God. But the joke is that's really similar to transgenderism because if a man can be born again and be whatever he wants, well, why can't he be a woman? Um, seems like he could, right? There's no limit to his autonomy. He can create himself in whatever way he wants to be. So that's the intersection between new age masculinity and feminism, which is Nick's point about the femcons. And then uh, I had this last bit, my favorite, get ready to slay queens because shit's about to get lit. Become the light that overwhelms the darkness. All things are possible. Only when we gift ourselves the optimism of becoming now, that language of becoming the light is the Luciferianism. Gift <laughs> yourself. So the lie is that perfection is something that yours that you is yours that you can give to yourself. You don't even really need redemption by anybody. It's all DIY theology, DIY redemption. And it's the opposite of what Christ was saying with by taking thought, we can't add one cubit to our stature. Jair says that we can shape reality, all of it, around our will to become. Now, what does that mean? If you are in control of shaping reality around your will, well, surprise, surprise, the creature has become the creator, which is, of course, what Satan whispered to Eve with, ye shall be as gods. So it's a cult of will to power, forgetting that it undercuts the possibility of free will. And adolescents of all ages just love to listen to this. They thrill to it because it's based on pride. And he finished weirdly by saying, um, chin towards God. Now, what does that mean to say chin towards God within the context of that framework? It's got to be just himself looking at the man in the mirror. That's ultimately what frame is. So, Nick, when you were talking about this Luciferianism, that was on my mind. Sorry for taking a while, but... Isn't it weird that you were picking that up? And he's a big account on X, over 100,000. And a lot of young guys are listening to him. And it's just basically new age hippie bullshit, but for men. Mic drop, Will. That was incredible. Yeah, I don't even know how to even end the episode. I think you just got to end it on that note, pretty much. That was a, this is why, Nolan, you got to be at the debate. By some miracle of God, we got to make that happen. Well, I would just defend Nietzsche from, from these goofballs a, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's got in, I mean, it, mic drop well, as usual, but Nietzsche's also got some healthy incel vol cell energy. It turns out he was, he was in love with Lou Salome and he was rejected by Lou Salome. 
But aside from that, he was kind of a vol cell. Um, he, he, he recounts, I'm thinking about this as we are recapping an episode where we're talking about the, the shit talking red pill guys from their like sex den in Vegas and uh, Vegas is disgusting. The, I'm reminded of the one time that Nietzsche went to a brothel. Uh, he, he's quite the vol cell. He said, I, I saw myself surrounded by a half dozen apparitions in tinsel and gauze who looked at me expectantly. Then I made for a piano in the room as the only thing with a soul in the entire company. <laughs> um, uh, so Nietzsche was, yeah, he was an atheist, an angry son of a Lutheran pastor, but he he had some healthy ball cell energy. And I would just say um, the reason Rolo et al that we didn't come to Vegas is because it's the shittiest, most wretched stink hole, this side of Gamora. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's populated by broke posers and oil rig waitresses because you guys deserve each other. That's why we don't want to go there. <laughs> See you in Miami. Take your penicillin and hopefully we can make this happen with Will Nolan. So, yeah, mic drop. It. That's it, boys. Good to talk to you guys. I will see you next week. Take care. God bless. God Thanks bless so much, guys. Peaceful. Yeah. Peaceful.